we have to move to the next talk, uh, which will be given by Francesca De Rossi, and she's going to speak about stability and upscaling of carbon-based perovskite solar cells. Good afternoon, all. Um, yes, I'm Francesca De Rossi from Specific, and uh, my talk would be um, an overview or about the work we've been making in this last year and something about the um, carbon-based perovskite solar cells or the triple mesoscopic stack. Um, actually, I changed my title because. Um, I mean, it, it came very handy to me to have Julia talking just before me because she addressed it so nicely all the stability issues. And so I'm, I'm going to focus in a little more on the processing side. So as you already know, um, this architecture is um, very interesting because even if it's not as efficient as other um, architecture cell, um, cell architectures. Um, it's very interesting to us because specific um, looks um, to uh, upscaling and printing any PV technology. So this one in particular, since it has all the three layers printable and is low cost because there's no spiral, no gold, and it's been uh, demonstrated several times that it's very stable is probably um, for us one of the best candidates for um, perovskite solar cells on rigid substrates. Um, so yeah, forgot about that. <laughs> so, um, so we like the screen printing of the three layers and we know that uh, this method is quite fast. The thing is that we are slowed down by the dry and sintering steps that we have to carry on um, after each layer deposition. So we are talking about over two hours uh, spent on uh, sintering and annealing layers. Another bottleneck of this technology for us is the manual infiltration uh, that we started doing by drop casting. So how have we overcome these uh, two last um, disadvantages? Um, so there's this nice piece of work by uh, Catherine Hooper and Jenny Baker uh, about the NIR uh, thermal uh, treatment of the, um, the three layers. So after the deposition of the blocking layer and the screen printing of both titania and zirconia, the two layers um, are um, exposed to NIR and in a very fast process, as you can see here, just uh, over 10 seconds, um, they are ready for the next step, which is the screen printing of the carbon. Again, NIR treatment at the 10 seconds. And then uh, we um, deposited the, the perovskite by, by a, a two-step deposition. So lead iodide first and then immersion in MAI solution. Um, and then the cells are ready for testing. So what is interesting is that from those two hours spent in thermal treatment, we um, reduce this time to just over 20 seconds. Um, and as you can see, the cells obtained are very similar to our control cells um, centered on a hot plate. And yeah, this is like one of the best cells, reaching a stabilized um, efficiency of 11%. EQE, um, integrated current from the EQE matching quite well the JSC from the JV scan. So yeah, if, you, if you'd like to know more about this, I invite you to look for Jenny, which is at the conference as well. Then, um, as I said, we used to um, manually infiltrating uh, the perovskite. Um, and since we were working with the two-step deposition, we had this, um, this coffee ring effect on our cells that limited somehow the efficiency that we can get from our cells. So a PhD student of ours, Simone Meroni, uh, came out with this idea of um, somehow automa automatize the, um, uh, the process. 
Uh, and he tried on these long strips that somehow mimic the, the, the cell in a module. But again, I mean, there was this problem of the coffee um, rings. So um, he added, at this point, a mesh uh, in this technique that he called robotic mesh. And in this way, the, um, the solution could spread more evenly and the infiltration resulted in a like, more even um, pattern like this one. And again, the, the, P, the um, performance of the cells were quite similar to our um, reference cells uh, made by drop casting. Um, obviously, the, the advantage of this technique is for large area devices, as I will show later. Um, so, what about stability? As I said, we started with mapping in our cell, and we tried to uh, stick them on the um, just white LED, so at one equivalent sun, in ambient conditions, so not encapsulated cells, and yes, they degraded quite uh, quickly. Then we tried the AVA mapping, and uh, yeah, at this point we, we got quite excited, and it happened that uh, while we uh, got these nice results, uh, Francesca Brunetti within the uh, stable cost next, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I, well, within this cost action, uh, she proposed that a big um, ex ex experiment, joint experiment on perovskite cells. So we volunteered and we said, oh yes, we are going to prepare a bunch of cells for anyone who wants to measure them. So we um, ended sending some cells to Barcelona and to Malta where they were tested um, outdoors and other cells to Bangor University in UK, where they were um, exposed to light and tested in the dark, and then some other cells around. So all the cells looked like this. So one centimeter square cells massed down to 0.5 centimeter, all encapsulated in air with a glass cover and UV curable epoxy all around the edges. Well, they, they weren't great, as you can see here, but I mean, we, we tried to take the, um, the opportunity of having some results from other labs. Um, so, yeah. These are the results from Bangor University. Um, so dark uh, room temperature, amb ambient humidity on the left, and uh, dark 65 degrees and ambient um, humidity on the right. So um, both sets of cells were quite stable, surprisingly at 65 degrees they were kind of more stable. Um, but under light they weren't stable at all. <laughs> so there, there was a kind of increase in the, in the performance at 65 degrees but then I mean, all the cells, these are like average values of three cells here, three cells on the other side. Um, but yeah, so at this point, we were a little um, um, yeah, depressed, if I can say. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously, we were comparing these results to the nice results from literature. And yes, it was not great. But the good thing is that I think we um, enter like in this nice network that Monica set up. And, and now we have a lot of collaborators, so it's good. Um, the, the amazing thing is that these cells, I mean, the, the cells from the same batch, outdoor in May, June, in Barcelona, where I think it doesn't rain that much, not much as it wants to, um, they, they work not that bad. Maybe as Professor Anfeld suggested before, our cells needed a, ni a good, nice sleep as well. So the, the light and uh, dark cycle somehow help them, or the UV filter, or the secondary encapsulation, we don't know. So we are investigating the uh, reasons. Um, other location, Malta, similar results. So in here, 
uh, each point is a measurement at midday. Okay? And then, with some other cells, so we test, um, again, the light soaking, but under different conditions. So this is not properly an ISO standard. So um, we test these cells at one equivalent sun under white LEDs and tracking the maximum power point. Again, they were not as stable as we imagined. Um, and Dr. Lucici now from Chichi Research was doing some extra characterization that he's um, kind of interprets now. And hopefully it will be included in this joint paper that we are preparing. Um, and there's like this curious thing that we observed. So for a couple of cells that we kept in the dark, we performed some Raman. And uh, the, 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 the interesting thing is that looking at the cells uh, from the carbon side, um, even on a fresh cell, not encapsulated, we could see some peaks that are characteristics of lead iodide, while these peaks are not that I mean, are not there for the encapsulated cell. What happens is that this, this doesn't change, so with time, uh, with the cells kept in the dark for several hours, um, from the carbon side, you, you keep seeing the same thing. What is interesting is that if you look at the, um, through the glass at the TiO2, um, we could see even for the not encapsulated cell that no peak for the lead iodide was there. So, somehow saying that there was no degradation as confirmed by the JV um, parameters reported in here. So we don't know, we don't know what happened for light socket cells. It would be very interesting, but we haven't performed the characterization yet. So. Um, now, while we were depressed about these results, we challenged ourselves trying to make even bigger cells, well, modules in particular. So we set as a target an A4 uh, size because it's like the maximum size we can process on our screen printers. Um, so yeah, again, we prepared like dedicated screens for that. We printed the three layers using just registration. And what we obtain is like devices like this, where there are 22 cells connected in series for a 198 centimeter square active area. Obviously, um, having to play safe, we needed to leave quite enough space between cell and cell. And as a result, the geometrical field factor was only 45.5. Anyway, um, yes, this is where that technique that I presented before, developed by Simone, helped a lot in terms of times and in terms of uh, spreading the solution all over the area and allowing us to obtain um, some, some working uh, devices, which was not so, um, um, how can I say, so, so um, trivial because we had quite a lot of problems, so like misprint, um, yeah, problem during the infiltration, uh, there was some carbon delamination where the carbon should um, connect to adjacent cells and somehow some of the, cell, of the module just broke up <laughs> with, with time. Uh, but the good thing is that, yeah, they were working and um, the, the weird thing is that they kept somehow increasing their performances, even if kept at ambient humidity. And yeah, so at, at some point you see that one series um, disappear because it's the broken module. Um, but what happened with the, the um, resisting one? is that we um, expose it to high, to high humidity, sorry, um, following the fundings uh, by Dr. Ashimi and the Solaronics guys, which reported that 
200 hours under these condition, uh, conditions of humidity at 40 degrees um, improved their devices from 9% up to 13%. So we thought, well, let's see if it worked for us as well. Uh, not that much, but we did notice an improvement when the, um, let's say, the, 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 this module was then dried somehow at very low humidity levels and very unexpectedly, um, so the, the best module after probably a couple of months since its fabrication delivered over 6% efficiency. Um, this is like the stabilized um, value. And what is somehow interesting, I think, I mean, maybe it's easily explainable, but uh, there's an improvement with light soaking. So if you keep, um, well, our carbon cells and the modules under light soaking for a certain amount of time on open circuit, you will see like an improvement in um, their performance. And um, to conclude, um, we demonstrated that the triple mesoporous stack is, is scalable and via just layer registration. So we just submitted this work. Obviously, the geometrical field factor can be improved um, using different approaches than layers registration. And the cost experiment we took part in, um, the, let's say the outputs were this one, even if they are not all um, good results. But um, we are now looking at the, the reasons why this happened, the non-high stability under illumination. So it could be that our cells are not good enough. F fair enough. I mean, maybe we, we did something wrong. We didn't get the right composition of the perskite. It could be that the UV plays a role, um, for example, um, leading to some superoxide formation due to the titanium um, uh, presence in the stack. So we are exploring and trying to optimize further our uh, cells. Um, so let me thank all the uh, so-called carbon group. So Jenny, Catherine, Dave, Simone, Dan, um, PV groups, leader Tristan, and then all the collaborators uh, from the stable Nexol Action. Um, yes, all the funders. And also I'd like to um, say that very soon, we're going to open a Mercury Fellowship and also a postdoc position. So if anyone is interested, please come and talk to me and I'll give you like some contacts or uh, websites where you ha can have a look at, the, at when the, the adverts are off. And I think that I'm done. So thank you. So, are there some questions? Okay, you're the first. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very nice for very nice work. Um, this the advantage of these solar cells are very stable. Yeah. The disadvantage is that efficiency is low. Yes, okay? indeed. Do you think uh, the low efficiency is because you don't, you are not we are you are not using whole transport layer? And and what is the the, the the role of the carbon in this whole transport process in this solar Yeah, well, this is, this is something that, that we don't know, and, and we are very like interested in finding out, because um, I think it's been probably one of our questions since the beginning, because we, we weren't sure how a thick cell like this one could even work. So, um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the, the, the low efficiency can, as you, as you might see or, or may, may know, um, we have very low field factor. So obviously we are losing something because we are not getting over 1%, uh, sorry, 1 volt uh, VOC, but maybe it's just our fault because as Julia showed before, it's possible to get one, um, I mean, higher VOC. The problem, 
I found is that we have very low fill factor. So obviously that, that could be related to the, to the thick layer, to the carbon conductivity. So uh, yes, there are probably several um, things to take into account for these cells being less efficient than other uh, cell architectures. Okay, thank you. Very nice uh, work, Francesca. I think that, just as a comment, um, that uh, for the VOC, you really have to be careful uh, on the crystallization of your material. Yeah. Crystal quality of your uh, yeah. perovskite, that that's really matter. And then a uh, very quick comment to Monica's question. Uh, yeah, she's, you are right, Monica, because uh, the carbon is not selective for holes. So it's, it's a really big problem. So you can re also get the electrons out. So we use it as a whole transporter material, but uh, the it's interface not. is not optimal. Mm. Um, we are trying uh, to engineer the interface with the carbon in order to uh, make it more selective for holes, but it's difficult because you cannot do a layer by layer approach because uh, you put the carbon first and the perovskite after. Yeah. But you're right. Okay, I think we should move on. Thank you very much one more time. Yeah.